again. This is like the third time I've tried to do this. I don't know much about making videos. Uh, hello, my name's Dylan. I, uh, I own and operate Paul's Axe Portable Sawmill uh, in uh, Minnesota, northern Minnesota. Um, I wanted to make this video on uh, about wood miser band saws and uh, blades, namely, uh, mainly. <laughs> um, and I, I'll apologize right now because I'm not very organized and I'm sure I'm going to be rambling all over the place, so bear with me. Hopefully it doesn't get too long. I guess that's what happened the last time the battery died. But hopefully it stays going. <clears throat> uh, anyway, the only reason I'm doing this is obviously I'm not uh, the greatest at this, but uh, is I, I, I'm a YouTube addict. I drink coffee and watch YouTube every morning, pretty much. Um, I like learning stuff and that's a pretty easy way to visually learn. Uh, it's like a big ass encyclopedia. It's great. Who doesn't watch YouTube? Um, so I watch all the Woodmiser videos. Um, there's a million of them out there. Bunch of guys running saws, the ones Woodmiser puts out, whatever. YouTube's full of sawmill videos and normally what it is, it's a guy standing there sawing a log. Um, that's great, you know, if you're looking at buying one, you want to see what they can do, all that. Um, but if you already own one and maybe you're looking for advice, yeah, you can call Woodmiser with all your questions and that stuff, but uh, sometimes for a quick fix, it's nice to see if somebody else has been through what you're going through kind of a deal. Um, so you start with YouTube, at least that's what I do. Um, anyway, so that's why I'm making a video, but uh, I just want to talk about blades and blade sharpening and doing it yourself. Um, I, run a, I run a portable sawmill business uh, for a living, that's all I do. That's all I've been doing for the last 10 years. Before that, I ran another sawmill uh, for someone else in a log, a log home uh, business where I didn't really saw lumber. I kind of put a flat on this, a flat on that, a pitch on that, a pitch on that, whatever. But I've been, and my dad ran a Woodmiser sawmill for 20 years before I did, and then I took over his business uh, doing the custom sawing, uh, portable sawing, uh, 10 years ago. So I've been around it kind of my whole life. That's all I really really done for work. I guess I did some other stuff, but um, anyway, enough of that. Uh, basically, I just want to talk about the blades, because um, there's not a lot of videos out there on blades. Uh, there's some, um, but they're not real informative. You know, they're, they're going to tell you you need a good blade. Okay, well, sure you do. Um, but if you're kind of a do-it-yourself guy like me, and if you're going to want to, if you're going to do what I do for a living, I mean, it's it's essential that you sharpen your own blades. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. Uh, your reputation depends on the quality of the lumber you produce, and the only way you're gonna know that when you start up your saw in the morning and hit that first log, if you didn't sharpen and set that blade yourself, you don't know whether or not it's gonna cut. You can assume and look at it visually, yeah, it looks pretty good, and nine times out of 10, the ones from Woodmiser, brand new or resharp, will cut just fine. But there'll be some times where they don't. And it's, it's kind of frustrating when you got your customer and all his neighbors standing there watching you and you put on a brand new blade and that thing dives right through a bar top you're making for them. Um, it, that, I mean, that happens. Um, I'm not saying doing it yourself is going to end that problem. If anything, you're going to have more of that when you first start. But uh, for me, doing the blades myself is paramount. I mean, unless, unless, I, unless you checked it, you don't know. Uh, that's the bottom line. Um, if you're like a hobby guy, you know, you, you, you might own a sawmill and you just maybe put 100, 200 hours a year on it or something like that, well, send them out to resharp. It's just not worth taking out the shop space and maybe you don't have the time, if you have a regular job on top of that, to sit in your shop every night after work and sharpen blades because that's what you'll be doing. Um, it's an everyday thing or on cold days here, it's, it's 22 below this morning um, in Minnesota. Well, I don't operate when it's that cold, but I got lots of blades to sharpen all the time. Um, so I do it then, or on rain days, or whatever. Typically during the week, I might spend an hour and a half in here after work. You just factor that into your day, not a big deal. Um, I like to sit in here and have a couple beers anyway, and it gives me a little time to do that. <laughs> but anyway, some things about sharpening. Um, don't, you know, don't be afraid of it. It's not, 
impossible to learn. It is hard to learn. I, I would say I had a harder time learning how to sharpen blades than I ever had learning how to run a sawmill or even, or even take apart a log uh, in the correct way. Um, you know, there's lots of stuff on that, but uh, it can be a real pain in the butt to figure out what you're doing wrong and why your blades just aren't as sharp as new blades. Um, it sucks trying to figure that out at first. With diagnosing that problem, is, 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 it can be daunting. You can follow the book to the T, but you'll find that it's, it's real hard to get the results they're talking about at first. Um, before I get too carried away, let me look at my little cheat sheet. Okay. The importance of quality, um, sharp and accurately set blades. How important is that? Well, obviously, it, it's, it's, your blade is the heart of the machine. That's the one thing that decides what your lumber is going to look like. If it's going to be smooth, I mean, that's what band saws are known for. If you're, if you're the customer hiring a band mill, typically you're doing it for two reasons. One, you don't want to haul the logs. Two, you want way more yield out of your wood and you want better cut quality. You want to use this stuff rough? Well, you know, I have you should be able to take a palm sander and make it smooth right off the mill. Um, there shouldn't be any reason that that can't happen. I mean, Grant, you'll get some chop here and there for different reasons, but if your sawmill is set up in a line right and you have good blades and good quality logs, that's also important. You, you know, your accuracy should be there and your cut quality should be there. That's, that's why people are going to hire a sawmill, a, a portable band sawmill, as opposed to a circle mill. Um, the benefits of sharpening your own blades, obviously the cost, I think that's one. Um, I think Woodmiser, when I did, when I, I used to do resharp for maybe the first year when I started out, I didn't want to learn how to sharpen blades. I figured I had enough other stuff to do, and you do. But I think they charge you eight bucks a blade, you know, with shipping or something like that. And for me, it was like a two week turnaround time. It wasn't out of the realm of possibility to continue using that service. I mean, it's fine. but. Eventually, I found I, I just I would forget um, to send them out, and sometimes I'd have uh, lag time and be waiting for blades, and that's that's not a good reason to sit at home on the couch because you don't have any blades. Um, I was young and learning at the time, I guess, but uh, um, the quality control that is apparent, that is the number one reason you do it yourself. You know that when you put that blade on, it it's going to cut. Um, it's going to cut the way you expect it to cut. Uh, the only variable will be the wood. That's what you want to eliminate all variables if you can. You want you want it to feel like you think it's going to feel when that blade gets into the log. Um, you'll know that if you 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 did a good job. You know your teeth are sharp. You physically inspected them. You looked at them. They're sharp. They're set right. You know they are within a thousandth of each other. Um, everything's ground the same. That's that's important. Quality control. That's you have complete control then by doing this yourself. Uh, some of the cons of sharpening is, the, like I said, it's a long, steep learning curve. Um, it's not a plug-and-play kind of thing. You can follow, you know, like I said, you follow their directions and their manuals, and that'll get you close. Uh, but there's obviously lots of other things you're going to run into, um, and you're going to not know what's going on. Um, you know, here's a good example of too much face grinding that. You know, as you get into this, you'll you'll kind of understand more. But I'm not going to explain every little thing about sharpening blades. It's just way too much. I'm sure this battery will die before I ever get there. But uh, too much face grinding um, that'll make a blade sharp right away if you face grind a lot. Uh, what else it does? I don't run water with my operation. I never have. Um, it's a mess. The reason they run water is to keep the dust down and keep the tips cool. Um, so if you are face grinding a lot without water, such as I do, I don't run water. Um, if you face grind too much, you'll turn the tips blue and uh, you sacrifice the hardness of the tip and your longevity between sharpenings will go way, way down. Uh, but your blade will be sharp. It, it will cut. The other negative too much face grinding is you lose your tooth profile. And maintaining your tooth profile, your teeth will get shorter. You take too much off the face and not enough off the rest of the tooth, you'll get shorter teeth. That's going to change the cutting characteristics. You're going to sacrifice blade life. Um, that's important. Keeping that profile the same is that's basically what you're trying to do with with uh, following all the directions they give you. You want to maintain that profile. There's a reason they cut so sweet right out of the box. It's they're not that much sharper than what you can get them. You can get them just as sharp as they come new. 
but typically what happens is you'll lose the profile. You won't notice it. You know, it, it, it's we're talking thousands of an inch variance um, over time. And if you're doing, if you're taking too much off the face, for example, that's just one thing you can do wrong. Every time you sharpen it, and the teeth are getting a little bit shorter, a little bit shorter. You keep losing that profile. You think the blade's just wearing out? Well, you're you're making it wear out. Uh, that's just one thing. So improper technique not being addressed. That that'll confuse the hell out of you and you'll try to compensate for that with your sawmill alignment and stuff like that and you'll just compound the problem and pretty soon you don't know what's going on you can't cut straight anymore you it seems like it's a lost cause band saws will get a bad name for that there's there was a guy in my area that started up and did little little cutting in a certain town around here and we didn't have any work in that town for five six years after the fact after he quit because no one in there believed that a bandsaw would cut straight lumber because he sharpened his own blades and didn't bother to learn how to do it properly so he's out there just making spaghetti lumber, we call it, you know, where the wavy. If you own a bandsaw, you know what I'm talking about. That's it's 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 an, the number one thing that happens when they get dull, right? They get wavy. Um, uh, setting the teeth, that is just as important as maintaining a sharp tooth, if not as important. I mean it's without that, without one you don't need the other, basically. If if your teeth aren't set exactly the same, each one, um, your cutting characteristics are going to change. You're not going to know what that blade is going to do. If they're set heavy on one side, it's going to pull that way, up or down, whatever. You'll think you're, and you'll you'll compensate with your blade guides, and you won't know why. Um, so making sure your teeth are set and not overset. You know, I I set my teeth at 25 thousandths. I run uh, to tell you what I what I do here. I, I run an inch and a half uh, width. 45 thousandths thickness, uh, 7 8 tooth spacing, and a 10 degree hook angle. That's kind of their all purpose inch and a half blade. I have a LT40 uh, with the 42 Kubota diesel on it, super hydraulic. Um, you can run wide, the more higher the horsepower you have, the wider the band you can run. Uh, some Most guys run inch and a quarter blades. Um, you just don't get the feed rate you do out of the inch and a half. Inch and a half blades are a little bit harder to maintain uh, in the winter time. Um, and there's tons of resources on what blade is right for you. Go check that out. But I don't run any, I run one kind of blade all year long, all species. I sharpen them the same way for all species. Yes, there are blades that cut better, have better profiles for different times of the year, for different densities of wood. I, I understand that, but for me to be switching back and forth, I have so many blades that I'm maintaining, you know, I would just get lost in the shuffle. I don't want to make sure I have enough blades for extreme hardwoods or frozen woods that day and not enough blades to cut soft with whatever or vice versa you know I run one blade um, I alter other techniques to deal with the conditions uh, it just makes makes life so much simpler to run one profile and that's a good profile to run um, things that I do um, um, not in order of importance this is all kind of jumbled I'm, I apologize for that but things that I do I, um, I always I, Maintain the profile is my number one goal. Um, and be sure that the teeth are actually sharp. They, this is not how you check and see if your teeth are sharp. They always feel sharp. They'll always cut you. It doesn't matter how dull they are. That's not how you, you, you gotta get, I have this little magnifier with the light. I don't know if you can find these things anymore. I'm sure you still can, but you gotta get down and look at the very tip of the, I wish I had a picture of it. The top tip corner, the very corner, outside corner of the tooth. There should be no reflection there at all. You shouldn't. Be, you should not. If you can see the tips, they're not sharp. Um, you know, you guys understand that from sharpening a chainsaw. You know, kind of when you roll the chrome over and it flakes off. There's you can't see the very tip. That's what you're after. The only way to do that is to look up close with a magnifier. Um, as I said, I don't face grind as much as uh, maybe they recommend. I do enough to keep the tips square and. I face grind enough to maintain my profile. I, I just want to take the burr off from the back grind. Um, I don't need to, sometimes I don't even face grind the entire face of the tooth as long as maybe two thirds of it are hit. Granted you can get stress fractures that are starting at the bottom of that tooth, but 99% of the stress fractures are going to be in the very bottom of the gullet, the narrowest part of the blade. Um, and that I always make sure I grind the gullet's good. I might sacrifice a little grind right here um, for the sake of longevity. Um, and not burning the tips. Um, I've side-by-side -side ground blades with way more face grind than I like right next to blades 
with no face grind. And the ones with no face grind cut as good or better than the ones with too much face grind. Like I said, too much face grind. They used to be, this was all by hand. It wasn't automated. You just, all you could do was grind the face and progressively your teeth got shorter. That's the old, old sharpener that they had. Um, like I said, it'll make them sharp, but you're gonna lose your profile and your cutting characteristics are gonna change each time you sharpen it. Um, so that's just a few, I'm not gonna go through every little thing I do. I mean, you guys have to look into that, but uh, <clears throat> that's maintain the profile being sure they're actually sharp, and being sure they're set right. Um, sometimes that's a pain in the butt, depending on what happened to the blade when it was on a saw. Um, if you hit something, and if you hit nails, you guys know what that's like, uh, it's hell on a blade. But sometimes you can hit one or two eight, eight penny nails, and you can get it out in five passes. Or I typically do three passes to, to, on an average blade, um, and I take light passes, more of them, uh, three passes a blade is my average. Sometimes you get a light nail hit, you might get uh, five, maybe six passes to get it back. Uh, but when you get it on the setter, now you're going to lose time because nine times out of ten, those teeth that hit the blade are going to be bent way, way over set. And you have to use that little hand tool to bend it back and then use the gauge to bend them to your 25 thousandths or whatever you're shooting for. Um, that's a pain in the ass. Throw them freaking blades in the garbage. Um, build a customer for them. It's, you know, I, I do. When I hit a nail, it's $15. If I wreck the blade, they buy the blade, you know, 30 bucks. Uh, they're actually about $25, I think, new. But by the time I've sharpened them three, four times, I got an hour of my own time in them. They're worth more. And that's why I do what I do there. Um, I typically don't charge people for nails on average because I carry a metal detector and you should too. Everybody that does custom sawing, you need a metal detector. It's 200 bucks for a white smell detector. They're great. They'll find everything. Um, you know, and you get four or five beeps in a log well, that's time to make firewood. But uh, that'll save you big time. I mean, you don't want to be hitting hardware. It's just, I understand that I've, you know, I've done a lot of these reclaimed timber jobs where you're guaranteed you're going to hit them old square nails and they're, they're no fun. Uh, the effect of that and the cost of those old timbers, you know, they're, they're a high buck commodity anyways. Um, those are crappy jobs, avoid them if you can. <laughs> well, it's popular now though, okay. <clears throat> uh, why I sharpen yeah, quality again, uh, longevity. I, um, longevity comes more down to not so much if you sharpen or if someone else sharpens. It's, I would say your blade longevity, you need to change those blades more often than you probably are. Uh, most guys will boast about how they can run all day on one blade. And, you know, if you're splitting cedar rails in half, four inch cedar rails in half all day, yeah, you, sh you, you probably can. But if you're sawing 2,000 feet of one inch lumber out of eight foot bolts all day, you're not going to get, you're not going to get 2,000 feet out of a blade. I like to change them at 500 board feet, whether or not they're still cutting great, I don't care. Um, it saves me time on the sharpener, you know, you run that thing until you know, until you can see in the cut that it's dull, you're gonna have an extra pass or two on the sharpener at night when you get home. That's just more time you spend out in the shop. Um, so just change them ahead of time. Keep keep an average interval. Obviously, if you hit something or uh, they're doing something wacky, get them off right away. Carry a lot of blades with you in your truck. You know, I, I carry a minimum of ten blades. I typically only change two to three times a day. I only run about six hours on the meter a day. Um, about every two hours, I'll change a blade. On average, like I said, 500, 750 feet. Depends on the species, a lot of factors. Um, but just, it's so much easier to change that blade than it is to try to sharpen one that's so dull. Um, and you're taking lots of flex life out of that blade. When you get those blades hot, um, that's not a good thing. Uh, keep your blades clean. Keep them clean while you're sawing. Obviously, keep the sap off. They won't saw right, right? If the sap is thicker than the set in the teeth, I mean, come on, they're not going to cut. But when you take them off, clean them. When you put those things on your, you know, they'll get that stripe of sap all the way around the inside of the blade. You, you'll be able to sharpen them. You put them on your setter and it's going to give you false readings. It reads off the body of that blade. Um, that's going to screw you up big time. You can't have, you cannot, people want me to sharpen their blades all the time and I say no way because you don't clean them. Um, keep them clean. Just I have a little diesel squirter. I kind of modify it onto my mill. That helps with the thick pitch, and when I'm going to change a blade, I fire it up, let it run, hit it with the water and the diesel, and it gets it clean. You just, just that's a good thing to do. Uh, 
metal detector, you gotta have a metal detector. Um, some other things that affect, I know I'm kind of jumping around here, we're talking about blades, but um, really we're talking about how good your sawmill cuts. Um, some things that are going to affect uh, how well you cut are the condition of the logs, and this is something that uh, you, you need to put a lot of that liability on your customer. Um, you got to inform him of what to expect with what kind of wood he has. Um, bandsaws are not the best thing for certain species in certain conditions. Um, they are, in my opinion, far and away better than a circle mill. They're not as productive, but their the quality is, is way better. But there are certain species and certain conditions where a circle mill is going to outperform a band mill, regardless. Um, logs that are really dry and really knotty. Where, I, where I'm at, there's a, we have a lot of Norway pine. That's our state tree. Um, Norway pine is a pretty soft wood, but the knots are really hard. Um, and if you let those things sit on the ground for two years, not only are you going to have all the, the blue stain and the worm holes and that, but the knots are just going to get harder and harder and harder. And the biggest thing with a, a good quality cut, what the wood does to determine that is the wood density. Um, consistent density, whether it be hard, soft, whatever, as long as it's consistent. And that's why knotty woods are hard to saw, that's why you'll get lumps over the knots, stuff like that. Um, you go, that blade kind of doesn't know what to do when it hits those condition changes throughout the cut and you need to watch your feed rate real close on stuff like that. You gotta tell the customer ahead of time, dry it out, knotty wood, you're gonna sacrifice some qu cut quality there. Um, logs should be, trees should be dropped in the winter time and sawn as soon as possible. Um, that's a rule that I think everybody knows or should know at least, although there is still that that frame of belief out there that if you let them dry out they'll saw better. I don't know where that ever came from, but the wetter the log, the greener the log, the easier it is on you, the sawyer. Uh, frozen wood's obviously harder to cut, but what's harder to cut than a frozen log is a half frozen log. That replicates the real knotty uh, softwoods like the, like the red pine. You know, white spruce is a terrible species to saw. Terrible. You can cut it straight, but boy, it's a chore. Everything's got to be exactly perfect. Um, there's a knot like every four inches, and in e even the clear ones. <laughs> um, yeah, that's gonna affect your cut. Those are those are what those are some of the hardest things to saw. You know, real knotty stuff, real dried out stuff, and half half frozen stuff. Early springtime stuff like that. Um, some thoughts on things that are easy to saw. What makes a log easy to saw? Well, sure, the softer they are, the easier they are to saw. That's kind of true. Um, red oak is probably the easiest species to saw. It's not the softest, but it's probably the most consistent. You, you find almost no variation between the knots and the, and the wood. Um, you can cut that with, you, know, you gotta watch your, watch your blade life on that stuff, because you can cut half the day with one blade. You can cut it with a dull blade and it'll be straight. Should be fuzzy, but it'll be straight. Um, so don't forget to change your blades even if you're still cutting good. And you're going, going back to that 500 foot rule, that's what I use. Um, green wood, white pine is a real easy one there, the knots are soft. Aspen, you know, super soft. Um, some of the real big stuff is, uh, you'll get some density variation with that, especially in the butt cuts. Um, consistent density is what gives you easy sawing. Uh, whether it be hard or soft, if you have the proper blade for the density of the wood you're sawing, you won't have a problem. Um, but yeah, I don't know what more I can say about blades. Um, don't, you know, don't be afraid to try sharpening yourself. It's not impossible to learn. It does take time to learn. Expect to be cussing out why the hell you can't sharpen a, a blade when you first start. Believe me, you'll, you'll have a hell of a time with it at first. At least I did. Maybe I have a longer learning curve, but... It sucked, you know, it was no fun. I, for a year there I struggled, didn't think I, didn't think my saw could cut or I could sharpen or whatever, but eventually you kind of understand uh, some of the theory behind what makes a blade cut. Um, the, and, and the books will go into that in detail more than I'm gonna, but uh, so yeah, that's hopefully provides a little bit of insight on, uh, on blade maintenance and why you should do it yourself. Um, like I said, ReSharp is a fine service, it's just you don't know what you're getting. I mean, you're getting quality. Woodmise is a great company. Um, I can't say enough about them. They're, they'll, sit, they'll sit on hold with you while you take stuff apart and test things and 
who else is going to do that with you? They'll hold your hand right through everything you need to know. Um, but sometimes, you know, you got to get into it yourself to really grasp the concept. Once you get a hold of the concept of what makes a blade cut, you know, other than just being sharp, why does it, this hook angle do better in this kind of wood than another? Um, what's the fundamental reason for all that stuff? You can, when you kind of wrap your head around that stuff, it makes sharpening and aligning your mill so much more logical and it makes so much more sense. You're not just reading directions out of a book. And that only comes with time and experience, but, and it's not unobtainable. At first it may seem that way, but you'll get there. But sharpen them yourself, give it a try. I mean, it's not that huge of an investment. I think I said that uh, you're buying a $40,000 sawmill, two grand in sharpening equipment. What's that? That's nothing, you know? Yeah, you're gonna have a learning curve. But if you plan on doing this for a living like I do, uh, you need to have complete control over all parts of your business, I think. I don't want to leave it up to somebody else. I do, you know, there's not obviously a wood miser uh, maintenance shop anywhere. I mean, you can get on a little schedule, but they don't come where I'm at. And I think Wisconsin is the closest place to have worked on. That's just out of the realm of possibility. You do things yourself uh, when you're self-employed. Um, it gives you control, uh, I guess. But, and blades, you know, with a bandsaw, your blades are the most important and most susceptible, vulnerable part of your machine. So if you don't have good blade, I buy Woodmiser blades. I mean, it doesn't matter what kind of blade you buy, I guess, as long as you keep them sharp and the right profi profile and doing what you want them to do. Um, but it's amazing. There's, there's sharpening services locally in my area that I had a friend of mine that bought a mill, couldn't cut whatever reason it was diving. I said, bring some blades over, let me sharpen them for you. And, I couldn't even sharpen them. The guy that sharpened them, I don't know what he did to those blades, but you know there was zero hook angle. Uh, the gullets were squared off. I don't know how he did that, but uh, the profile is completely gone. I said they're they're junk. You know, <laughs> he didn't didn't follow the the rule there, or whatever. But uh, and and you know I'm sure that guy believed he was producing a sharp blade because they were probably sharp when he touched them. You know, they look sharp in the magnifier, but the profile's gone. That stuff all needs to be maintained consistently. Do it like they tell you to do it. Woodmiser does a lot of research and development on these blades and they're always coming out with something better so they're always learning too. But listen to them um, and give it a try. <laughs> I hope this wasn't too rambly. Um, Alright.